もしやコスモではコスモ,コスモ AP ラミデュアリースポーツGotta remember to design these boards with more room for the bolts. Okay, signal's done. So now to move on to the last two boards, which are the brake lights. Oh, I guess I could show you how they work first. Translated very well on camera due to the reflections、uh, in the lenses, but let me tell you, in real life, it looked spectacular. Now, I guess you can see what I'm going for with the,、uh, the outer halo surrounding an inner field of LEDs. Now, it's just a matter of making the boards for the、uh, brake lights, and then it all comes together. You recall that in episode 41, I drew the board outlines up in CAD to check the fitment in the taillight housing. Copper connection allows an image to be inserted onto the workspace. So it's very convenient that I already have it all drawn out. Then I can convert to polygon, and then convert to lines, and that gives me. An editable pattern that I can treat just like any other vector image in Copper Connection. Very convenient so I don't have to redraw the shape. From here, I start designing the board by first placing all of the LEDs. The standard LED symbols included with copper connection have a flat side, which makes them difficult to line up, so I made my own that are completely round. Another thing I do is put a little tail on each side, which allows me to easily space them up on the screen. Then finally, I copy and paste them in large groups, lining up the tails, forming a grid that I can position. Shove that right into the center of the board, and then do the final adjustments. And now, just connect everything together with traces. And at this point, it just degrades into hours of connecting the dots between LEDs with the traces. The LEDs are grouped in groups of five, and each group of those five LEDs is in parallel. Yeah, I could just connect the whacking great mess of them in parallel. But that would mean a large current draw through the dropping resistor, which would mean a 5 or 10 watt resistor, versus being able to put them in、uh, series parallel groups 
thus meaning that the dropping resistor for each group is much smaller, quarter watt or half watt, a lot easier to fit on the board. Now the trick here is trying to arrange everything on an oddly shaped single-sided board without having to cross traces because you can't just cross traces you have to put in two pads for a jumper so it takes a little bit of thought process and mental agility to uh, plan this thing out to cross lines underneath things like resistors now there's going to be someone out there that is going to say hey Aaron you should just use Eagle and use the auto router but that's because they've never actually used the auto router in Eagle. If I was to auto route a trace from here to here, the auto router would probably send it all the way across the board, zigzag, make a yellow brick road journey all the way back there. Auto router doesn't work. Gotta put my name on the board, of course, in case the car is unearthed by future archaeologists thousands of years from now after some sort of apocalypse situation. They might want to know who built such mastery. And done! Just made a printout out of the outline of the board. That way I can figure out how much copper I need to cut. Well, the pattern is designed, the board is cut, which means it's time to print and then etch. If for some reason you didn't see part one of this, I'm using the uh, toner transfer method to etch these boards. Get this stuff out, there we are. may have to print the top one again. It's kind of a light spot in the toner. Bottom looks fine though. And it'll take a few minutes for the laminator to warm up. So I'll clean the board in the meantime. Scotch bright and then some acetone. Remove all the fingerprints and oils and oxidation. Ah, this copper is more tarnished than the underside of a $5 hooker. Yeah, that noise in the background is the heater. It's negative 24 Celsius outside. Once again, I stole the laminator from work. So let's see if I can break it. I found that it helps to just put a little bit of pressure onto this the first time you send it through just in case it wants to jam up. And actually if you want to do this yourself, this laminator happens to be from Staples, but I have seen the same one online sold under about a million different brands. It's obviously just made in China, but it is a beast of a laminator, it makes a lot of heat. go horizontally oh this must be fascinating to watch and into the water to remove the paper For the size of the board, we're going to need it all. Well, it's a little cold in here, so I think we'll warm this up a bit. I uh, have no idea how long one microwave spare chloride for. One minute?
That might be too warm. Oh, that really doesn't fit, does it? That sucks. No, oh, this is not boring at all. I'd say that's done. So I was moments away from drilling this, and then I discovered something. I am not, in fact, perfect. It's a mistake on the bore. That's it, right there. Pads that go nowhere. And that is what it's supposed to look like. Pads that go somewhere. And you'd think I would have caught the mistake before I went through the whole process of printing it, transferring it, etching it, wasting all of that material and all of that time. But no. So, there was some swearing, and I corrected the CAD drawing, and then off camera, I re-etched the board. Apparently, I'm very not perfect. Not sure how I did that. Easy to fix with a little delicate Dremel work. Yeah. Much better. Of course, since there's two lights, through the magic of editing, I made two. And now the liquid tin. I read the MSDS on this stuff, and hence I am now wearing the gloves, because Dear God, this is probably the worst chemical I have ever worked with. You do not want it on your skin. This is, however, just so cool how it happens. I think this liquid tin is just about used up. And done like a prom date, ready to solder. And now it's just a matter of soldering them together. Usually when soldering these boards, you want to start with the smallest parts like the resistors. Um, I'm going to have to skip some of them because the electronics store gave me 91 ohm resistors, half watt. And uh, what I need is 47 ohms, so... Unfortunately, that means that I'll have to wrangle some resistors on the board uh, after I've soldered on the, uh, the LEDs. And another few hours of that. Now the real trick when dealing with a non-silk screened homemade board is remembering where everything goes.
I try to keep the uh, color codes on the resistor all oriented the same way, just because it looks nicer. The board tarnished a bit in the shop. I guess it was the really moist weather, but a quick cleaning with the uh, Scotch-Brite and uh, it cleaned up and it's soldering pretty well, so aside from aesthetics, not too worried about it. To be really honest, I have always much preferred copper colored boards than tin colored boards anyway. When you're really good at cutting these leads off, they don't even hit you in the eye. Putting the, uh, the big LEDs in first so that they set the height of the board for when I put the small LEDs in. With the LEDs, I usually solder one lead, then let it cool, then go back and solder the next. Okay, well, I have a lot of these to do, so I think we're going to stop the camera for a moment, and uh, next time I turn it on, there's going to be a bunch more LEDs on here. Got to make sure to push down on the board so that the LEDs sit flush while the uh, solder cools down. And now the little 5 millimeter... <laughs> and now the little 5 millimeter LEDs. You know, it's interesting to note that these I just purchased from an unnamed supplier uh, in China in bulk and they're backwards. The flat spot is on the anode, not the cathode. Every LED I've ever seen, the flat spot is on the cathode. This is the last row. And done! Wow, I haven't filled that many tiny holes since, insert your own joke here. And then some wires so I can get this thing some power from the driver circuit. And now, of course, let's give her a test. Awesome. Also awesome. Even awesomer. Yep, I think that'll do. And magically off camera, one became two. Not bad, just needs a little trimming. I left plenty of area on the board right here because I figured I would have to trim it. Oh yeah, this thing has to come out. So just like the one above it, this side has to go down quite a lot in order to be underneath the lens and uh, this corner looks like it has to go as well. The tool for that of course is my Dremel with a drywall bit. Wow, fits first try. Yep, I'm just that good. Okay, let's see if I can mark this. And now I just have to slowly insert my rod. 
and mark it for some trimming. I'm gonna say around here. And a quick bending to match the angle of the light housing. I'll see if I got that one first try. And insert my bent rod into the hole. Oh, look at that. I'd say that's some talented rod bending. First try, I think. We're damn close. What I didn't show is the five minutes I spent with it after I turned the camera off. Hey! And then four more of those. Now these holes don't have to be in exactly the right, perfect place because there is a little bit of uh, wiggle room provided by the flexibility of the threaded rod. In this particular hole, ended up right where this nipple is. Nipples always get in the way. One nippleectomy. Thought I would be able to get away without bending that, but apparently not. So the question is, did I get this right first try again? Not that I would spend five minutes off camera, you know, tweaking it, of course. And now the board can be bolted in at all four corners. These uh, bolts on the bottom allow me to adjust the height of the board so that it's as close to the lens as I can practically get it. But they won't be tweaked until the final assembly because the lens has a gasket as well, which is going to raise it out from the boards a little bit. I don't know the thickness of the gasket because it's frankly not available. So I'm going to have to cut some out of some uh, rubber or something, or, uh, or maybe just run a bead of silicone around. Freaking tiny nuts. Sorry, I just don't have any experience handling tiny nuts. So I'm kind of out of practice. Done. And you know what I'm going to say next? Well, now I just have to make the other side. time to produce the boards for that controller you saw me design in part one. Now these boards I actually designed about a year ago when I was still in the midst of getting this fabrication area sorted out. Nice thing about things like CAD is that you can do it sitting on your parents porch in the summer with the sun shining and a warm cup of tea with a laptop. I have learned not to use compressed air to dry this off because the compressed air will actually get under the toner and blow it right off the board.
That, that was a good transfer. Some are better than others. And this sliced up washer fluid jug is an awesome etching tank. Go to the MG Chemicals website and look up the material safety data sheet for ferric chloride. On the website, it specifically says, do not heat by microwave oven. This jug works so well that I don't even have to wear gloves. Yeah, I'm going to call that done. Oh, that's a good etch. That one worked out very well. It helps immensely to secure the board to a, a backer like a piece of wood when you drill the holes. That avoids splitting the other side of the board when the drill bit pokes through. Oh yeah, delicate activities like this are a great thing to do when you are up until 2.30 in the morning the previous night at a Suicide Girls burlesque show. I'm tired. A little bit of acetone removes the toner. That is a good etching. Now soldering the uh, controller together is basically the same as soldering the light boards. Of course there's just more to it than resistors and LEDs. Opto isolators. doing something slightly different with the MOSFETs. I'm soldering them to the underside of the board because these have a tab on the top that is not only the source but also functions as the heat sink. So very carefully clamp it gently in place apply just enough heat. A bit sloppy, but it's on there. Now these are not going to dissipate much heat. So the, uh, the copper pad is going to provide all of the heat sink that's necessary. Pulse width modulation is very efficient. Here's a close-up of what I was going for with the MOSFETs and the completed board. Yes, I put the socket in upside down. By now you might be able to guess what I'm going to say. I have three more of these to do. So since that's pretty repetitive, I'm going to turn off the camera, start on the next set of boards, and through the magical unicorn fart-powered pixie dust of editing, the next time you see me, they'll be complete. It took lots of repetitive work off camera, but both lights are now fully LED-ded. Did. Uh, one minor problem though. The same space occupied by the board wants to be occupied by this protrusion, which appears to be some sort of reflector. And naturally, the only solution, of course, is to attack an almost irreplaceable set of taillight lenses with a Dremel and a cutting wheel.
Oh, this is so very butt puckering. This is like 99% cut, so I think I can just very carefully wiggle it off. Well, the lens now fits. But that looks stupid. You can see right through the clear lens and see the LEDs beneath. The lens, of course, has these little molded domes which diffuse the light. The piece that I cut out has them as well, but unfortunately, because it's also a reflector, it almost completely blocks light. So I looked around the shop for like an old tail light or, or something like this, and uh, the first thing I saw was this. And we all know what that is. That's the uh, diffuser from a fluorescent light. I always take the diffusers off my fluorescent lights because I prefer the bulbs. It actually, uh, it's actually brighter. Well, I'd say that's pretty damn good. It's about as close as match as you can get. The Dremel rotary file makes a great little end mill to uh, smooth these out. Excellent, all trimmed and I didn't even ruin it. Oh come on, you didn't think I'd do an entire taillight project without at least once involving a fluorescent light diffuser, did you? Well, I have no idea how to cut this, so by default that means Dremel. Stuff smells like peppermint when it melts. Light-wise, it works very well. Just gonna make sure the inside of this is as clean as I can get it. Nothing special, just a damp rag. So don't want to scratch the plastic. This is a Permatex plastic epoxy specifically designed for bonding plastics. I've used it many times before. It works really great. It smells awful. It's only good for about five minutes, so. Gotta be quick. Don't need a lot of it. Because I don't want to get any epoxy on other areas of the lens. And what I'm purposely not going to do is glue the bottom just because there will be moisture between the two lenses naturally because there's moisture in the air that I will be trapping between them. So let's leave the bottom open so that it can breathe so that it will not form condensation. And now the moment of truth. Not bad at all.
Of course, the uh, control boards need a case. So I just picked up these uh, Hammond uh, flanged cases from the local electronics store. As well as these plastic circuit board standoffs. So I'll just screw it through the bottom. Get off these self tapping screws are not quite self tapping. One. Two, then the board just snaps into place. And off camera, because it's exactly the same, I did the top half of the case. And the other controller for the second tail light. Well, now that they are cased, we need to get some signal and power to the boards, which means soldering up some of this electron hose. Now there are a whole bunch of these connections to make and the boards get wired to one another to share power and ground and the, uh, the halo connection. So it's a little confusing when it's all piled in that case. I admit I have already done one off camera God, how much solder does this joint want? I have already done one off camera so that I could get it straight in my head. Now in the case, the uh, boards sit roughly like this. So the wires will have to come up and over about here. should do it, which of course is what she said. The two halo trigger wires are tied together as they will simply receive power when the uh, headlights or marker lights are on. Don't forget the flux ring over to clean that nasty corrosive flux off of your solder joints. And a little heat shrink insulates the joint. This is not my regular adhesive lined double wall heat shrink. This is just single non-adhesive heat shrink because all of this is in a case anyway and it's, it's just to um, prevent the wire from shorting anywhere. Well, I have nine more of these wires to solder. So what I think we're gonna do is once again invoke the magic of editing and when we come back, we'll move on to something more interesting. And the result of all that soldering is this mess. Basically, power supply and inputs on the left, and then outputs to the LEDs on the right. Well, I guess we have to make some holes in the case for those wires to come through. I'm kind of eyeballing it, but if it's one millimeter off, the world isn't going to care. Does the world care? You can probably guess that I made two. Now that they are assembled, we got to remove all that solder flux from the boards so they don't corrode. Because over time, that flux will become conductive and even more corrosive as it's exposed to moisture. This is an Oral-B toothbrush, number one brand recommended by dentists worldwide. It, uh, it says so on the brush. I don't know if those dentists recommend it for this use. Now 
Now several coats of acrylic conformal coating. Each side of the board receives four coats in an alternating crisscross pattern to make sure that there's 100% coverage. And uh, I have also taped over the uh, processor sockets so that I don't inadvertently insulate the pins with the uh, conformal coating. Okay, time to shove it in the box, which I guess is what she said or commanded. This is a plastic case, so I don't actually need any sort of grommet. But what I will do is stick a zip tie on the inside and the outside to sort of prevent the cable from being pulled around. The wires from the top board wrap around so that they can open up kind of like a really limited clamshell. There, so I can still open the case and access the chips. But for now... The controller needs connectors now. Of course, like always, I'm using Weatherpack style connectors. Well, I like to put a little bit of dielectric grease on the wire lead just for some extra insurance. And the pin. Give that a crimp. And finally, close the retainers around the seal. Yeah, one day I will buy myself an actual weather pack crimper that does this all in one operation. And slip on the connector. I have this many more of those to do, and if you've seen one, you've seen them all. The tail light boards also need the conformal coating, so since it has a 15-minute recoat window, I'm tossing some coats of coating on while I'm also working on installing the connectors. Using one of these four-position connectors is almost a special occasion. I almost never get to use them. Fully connectorized. Since the two brake light sections operate as one, I'm uh, combining the power and signal wires so we can uh, reduce the wire count coming out of the light and also to save on a connector. Every one of these retaining bolts needs a shot of blue Loctite and a good snugging. And every single one of these LEDs needs a dab of adhesive to secure them to the board. I was thinking I would have mounted them flush to the board because that would have saved me a lot of bloody time but I wanted them as close to the lens as I could get them. This is just polyurethane construction adhesive 
Nothing <laughs> special here. Jam some on the leads, then fold the LED back up vertically. Oh god, well that took an hour. Now the reason I didn't just glue these things right into the housing is that I needed the adjustability on the rods in order to be able to position the boards as close to the lens as possible. Now I'm just making those adjustments. They're actually both really close. It's just a matter of Popping out the board, turning the nuts down just a little bit, popping the board back in, checking the fit. Luckily, both these boards, by random chance, are actually pretty damn close. So, minimal adjustment is required. Just had to drop the bottoms down a little bit. With the adjustments made, each one of these nuts needs to be locked tighted in place. So, to mark their location. Give them a dab of blue Loctite. Then spin them back up into place. And I have to do this uh, six more times. Oh yeah, plus the signal. I am immensely happy that this is the last time these boards are in and out of these housings. With everything locked tight into place, all I have to do is perform an insertion. Pop the little washers on. And of course, every one of these now needs a dab of Loctite. And a tiny nut. These nuts are infuriating to get on. And with them all in place, they get snugged down. The board will flex just a little bit. That's okay. Well, with all the boards in place, it is with immense, satisfying pleasure that I snap this lens into place. The last step in the lights themselves is, of course, adding the connectors. You'll notice that there's still several areas of the lights that are open on the back. The uh, holes for the original harness and where I had to trim to fit the boards. I actually have no intention of closing these up because from the factory these lights were not sealed to the inside of the car. And the way I see it, ventilation is probably a good thing. Now if I do have a problem in the future with insects or uh, something finding their way in there, 
I can always just cover the holes with some super sticky electronics grade tape. I should also mention that there is in fact a gasket that goes between the tail light lens flange and the uh, flange on the casing, which I have not installed yet because I will be taking the lenses off of the housing at some point in the future so that I can polish them. I figure that is probably easier done off the car than squatting at the back of the car for three hours. You know what that snap means? That snap means tail lights are done. Now it's time to just program the AT Tiny 85 uh, Arduinos, and this is just done through the standard Arduino um, um, environment. I talked about that code in episode uh, 41. The uh, updated source code is on the website. We'll put the um, um, link on the screen now. I need to program four chips, two for the brake lights. and then two more for the signal light controllers. It's actually the same code for each chip, just with a minor change. Again, all this code is documented on the website, so if you want to see it, the address is on the screen. But to set it for signal light controller mode, I just change a Boolean variable to tell it that it is now controlling the signals. And program. And then, of course, shove the appropriately programmed chips into their designated holes. Making sure to line up pin one with the top of the socket. And I'm not gluing these things in yet, but once I have the final programming, I will uh, put on a dab of adhesive so that they don't rattle loose while the car is going down the road. Well, the time has come. I have everything wired up temporarily in the trunk. So let's go for the money shot. We'll power the system on. That's the opening celebration. And we'll turn the boring reverse lights on first. Yep, they work. Check the signals. Signals are signaling. Turn the marker lights on. Marker lights work. Now let's apply the brake light. Brake lights applied. And finally, let's apply the brake lights, how they would run during the day, with the marker lights turned off. And that's the end of episode 42. Um, as you can tell, my shop is coming along, but still in a significant amount of disarray. But that will be ending soon. I'm hoping very soon to have this place all finished up looking pretty and being functional. That said, I don't quite know when episode 43 is going to drop, but it will certainly be um, sooner than the gap between 41 and 42. And it will be a little more metal-oriented versus the detailed, fiddly electronics work. 